Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 26, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier today came across an interesting site that offers ransomware as a service. All you have to do is provide a Bitcoin address to which the ransom will be paid, how much ransom you're asking for, and then it will create the binary for you. Now, the particular site that Xavier found here didn't seem to be quite operational. For example, the support address is just example at example.com. Now, the guys that run the website will keep 10% of the ransom for themselves. So for that, you probably should expect better support. But Xavier then turned around and looked at if he could find some samples on via Google. And sure enough, he got across a couple of examples that did match this particular pattern and well sure enough it was your standard ransomware interesting sort of that this particular ransomware is compiled for 64-bit versions of windows microsoft's anti-malware which xavier left enabled on his test system did not actually detect this particular malware if you ever scripted an HTTP request, chances are you used libcurl or a variation or wrapper around it. Well, uh, libcurl apparently had an interesting security flaw ever since it was first released in 1999. The problem here is what happens when libcurl encounters a redirect. What libcurl does if it's configured to follow redirects is it sends the same request to this new URL, including all custom headers, which may include authentication headers. If you're just defining authentication headers as a custom header, then of course libcurl doesn't really have a concept of this authorization header being a header that should not be sent to this second URL. Exploitability is a little bit limited because essentially in order for this to be exploited, the first site that you send libcurl to will be the one that has to redirect you to the untrusted site. Now, you already sent your credentials to that trusted site and it could take your credentials right there if some malicious person for example, has control over that trusted site. On the other hand, there may be exploits like, for example, HTTP response budding or such that can then be used to redirect you to the new site. So there may certainly be some cases where this is actually a valid exploitable vulnerability. A patch is available. I wouldn't rush it out. I would just wait for your respective distribution to offer new libraries. And Bitdefender found yet another Internet of Things botnet. Now, in this particular case, the botnet seems to be a little bit more sophisticated than what we have seen in the past. Typically, when we're looking at these Internet of Things botnets, they're either sort of these simple denial of service botnets like Mirai. We have seen a lot of uh, crypto coin miners. This one is a more complete kind of botnet that allows a uh, bi directional channel to whoever's control of the botnet and then also allows for commands like data exfiltration. Also, the initial compromise seems to be a little bit more complex than just password guessing. Yes, it does the password guessing too, but in addition to that, it also has a number of web application exploits and even has some TFTP exploits if it figures out that the victim is on the same subnet as the attacker. Bitdefender calls this particular botnet hide and seek. They first saw it around January 10th. They said it then died off a little bit, but came back around January 20th. And they're believing that there are about 20,000 affected devices. And uh, it's Friday again, so uh, we have an other SDI student after a break uh, to talk about a research uh, project here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? 
Sure. My name is Alfredo Hickman. I, uh, I lead security product engineering and research and development at Rackspace Managed Security. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a SANS Technology Institute master's degree candidate right now. I'm about two thirds of the way through the, uh, through the master's of science and information security engineering program. And, uh, and I've recently completed my, uh, my, my second research paper, uh, which was focused on intrusion detection analysis in, uh, in Linux application container networks. So Linux application containers, of course, it's a hot topic these days. What are some of the real challenges that you're running into in these environments? Can you just summarize that? Sure. Yeah. So there's a few challenges, many benefits associated with containerized uh, applications and deployments, but there's also a lot of challenges, challenges for IT operators, for, uh, for security professionals and the like. In the security space, I would say that probably the dynamic nature of, uh, of Linux application container environments, ephemeral life cycles of these containers, you know, uh, containerized applications uh, being provisioned in, in the tens of hundreds and in some cases thousands um, and List li living only for very short periods of times, uh, sometimes minutes at a time. So from a security perspective, that introduces a lot of complexity, uh, very rapid uh, response detection and response cycles. Uh, vulnerability management becomes uh, quite challenging. And uh, in, in the particular case uh, relating to my research, intrusion detection and analysis becomes quite challenging as well. So one thing to deal with a lot of the ephemeral parts so would probably be to just Put your intrusion detection sensor at your gateway. Uh, look at all the traffic and don't worry about you know all the details with the containers and such. Uh, what are some of the problems that you are running into with this approach? Why doesn't this really work that well? Here? Sure, and and that type of a, a traditional intrusion detection paradigm is still somewhat useful, and, and it's very uh, it's still somewhat beneficial. However, it does not provide the same kind of level of observability or or um, analysis capability that you would expect, kind of in a traditional physical or virtual environment. I think probably the most direct reason for that is the very common um, uh, approach of using non-standard application network port protocol assignments. So in traditional networks, if you're hosting a web server, uh, you're typically exposing port 80 um, or 443 for, for SSL TLS. Um, in, in containerized environments, you might have tens or, or even hundreds of web servers that are uh, hosted on the same hosts or clusters of hosts that are all exposing uh, port 80, but in themselves within their own networks are being bound to non-standard ports, could be any port uh, really. And that makes intrusion detection analysis at the perimeter edge kind of in an umbrella or even in a focus sensor kind of method much more difficult because your engines, your intrusion detection analysis engines are really expecting consistent and, uh, and standardized uh, ports bound back to applications and hosts and, and, and things like that. So that makes it a, a little bit uh, challenging there. Now another issue sort of you know, from the network point of view is uh, all these ephemeral containers and you basically start them up, you take them down sort of as needed. Uh, that also poses quite a bit of challenges for vulnerability scanning or uh, if you do a vulnerability scan, half of these containers may not even be up and running. So you don't really notice what's happening there or a container may be, I guess, idle for years until you finally decide to take them up and uh, by then of course it's outdated, it hasn't been patched or so. Uh, how do you overcome some of these challenges? Now, traditionally you would run your network vulnerability scan like once a week, once a day or whatever. That doesn't really work there. Or uh, anything else here that you sort of found that works in these containerized environments? Yeah, well, actually, I think that you just you just kind of hit the nail on the head. The question that you just asked is probably one of the questions that I get asked most frequently, right? W what is the value of intrusion detection uh, and analysis in, in container environments when these containerized applications are living for such short periods of time? By the time that we triage and surface and, and, and assign uh, cases and the like, um, you know, th those containers are gone. Well, th that's a really good question. Um, I would say a, a couple things. One, from a holistic security perspective uh, within a container environment, you'll see a, an approach that's a little bit different. Uh, vulnerability management is really done at a couple different um, phases. 
it's still extremely important to to harden your host, the actual hosts that are servicing the containerized application workloads. You still have to secure them. You still have to uh, identify vulnerabilities and remediate those. You still have to instrument those with a host-based intrusion detection uh, sensors and the like. But now getting into the containerized applications, a couple things. The, uh, the security paradigm in container environments really calls for more of a continuous, ongoing um, kind of a paradigm. The, the, the buzzword du jour would be um, dev, sec, Intel ops, right? Uh, you take a, a intelligence-driven security approach to the development, the, the application development lifecycle. So from the moment that your developers are committing uh, code to a repository, that is being cryptographically verified, signed, you have attribution back to that developer. Once the images are being created to service that 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 particular application runtime and its dependencies, that is uh, immutable now and not subject to uh, to to uh, changing of integrity and modification. Secondarily, you're conducting vulnerability scans against the actual images themselves as well, so that you can identify vulnerabilities with those and address those vulnerabilities back in the build process of those uh, of those container images. And then, as you provision them, uh, you can also incorporate application security type of of systems such as runtime application self protection. So, in con in the container security paradigm, you take a very holistic security approach to kind of uh, uh, mitigate those vulnerabilities and attacks and, and, and things like that. Now, how would an attacker actually get persistence in an environment like this? Um, like, when the container is gone before the attacker gets their reverse shell back. So, um, would they go all the way to the host for that? Or, and how do we prevent and look for this? Is this some of the indicators you're looking for here? Yes, absolutely. Another another one of the very common questions. So so this one gets very very complicated. It depends on what the intention of the of the attacker or what the um, the intent of the attacker is, right? Um, typically, when you look at at attackers' motives, and they vary very drastically. Um, one very common um, uh, motive is the is the stealing of intellectual property, right? We uh, look for for vulnerabilities in application logic or in hosting systems or whatever for us to be able to exploit that logic or those systems to be able to gain access and persistence and move through a network for the exfiltration of data. Um, oftentimes, if you as an attacker exploit a vulnerability within a containerized application, um, you know, that, that application could be gone before you're able to really establish persistence, right? So um, there, the, the benefit, I guess, that you get there is more from a security analytics perspective because you can detect um, patterns of you can detect patterns of behavior. You can start understanding TTPs, techniques, tactics, and procedures of the adversary, and respond to that. From an adversarial perspective, you can uh, you can use uh, the vulnerabilities within containers to be able to hop amongst other hosts, exploit the hosts, and then if you do not have uh, proper network segmentation and instrumentation at those network perimeter edges, the the threat of actually moving from a host in a container network into a more traditional network is a very real uh, possibility. So you see um, some of the, uh, the the very kind of bleeding edge uh, attacks that are being done in container environments, um, exploiting uh, namespaces and other type of control mechanisms for process segregation and accounting to be able to break out of the container. Um, vulnerabilities within the actual kernel to be able to siphon information, to, uh, to, to collect leaked information, such as with the uh, recent uh, vulnerabilities uh, detected with a Spectre and and meltdown and the like. Um, I, in my research that I published through through STI, um, in in my literature review, uh, there was research that was done on power amplification attacks, where uh, attackers were able to collect enough information from a multi-tenant implementation of a container uh, deployments, such as those uh, common commonly found in orchestrated cloud deployments, where they were able to co collect uh, power utilization information. Um, they were able to understand what power uh, utilization looked like over periods of time and then introduce stimulus into the environment to actually spike power utilization during peak times where power utilization was already high to actually physically break down the, uh, the, the host's that we're hosting these containerized applications. It's a it's a quite a fascinating space with lots of possibility for both defenders and also for for those on the other side. 
This sounds really scary. You know, in, in your own experience, uh, do you see attackers actually take into account that they're attacking containers or are they pretty much dealing with them like they're not knowing really that they're attacking containers? So uh, what kind of attacks do you see there? Sure. Yeah. Oftentimes in the security analytics that, that, that we collect from our from our service provider networks, um, um, oftentimes it appears that our adversaries do not even know that, that they are attacking containerized applications. Um, you know, it becomes for, for all intents and purposes, when you can when you conduct offensive actions against a container um, at the application layer, it's very difficult to detect that, that you're actually uh, attacking a containerized application. It's not really until you're able to exploit some vulnerability, whether in the application logic or in the underlying hosts through traditional host scanning and, and exploitation that you're really able to to get a foothold and really move from a containerized application or move from uh, exploitation of a host vulnerability into being able to understand what environment that you're working in, right? Um, at, at that point, kind of your options are, 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 are presented to you. you. You can understand that you are in a containerized environment um, and, and kind of get a lay of the land. But it is very challenging. And from, from our analytics and our threat intelligence reporting, uh, much of our adversaries do not seem to know that they are in containerized applications or networks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, anything you're working on right now sort of to follow up on that research or anything that um, may be interesting to the listeners? Sure. Yeah. So in the research that, that I published, um, I took kind of a, a comparative approach to assessing the efficacy and capabilities between different intrusion detection analysis systems and then kind of applying those exact um, methodologies typically used within, um, within uh, physical and virtual networks. Uh, attempting to use those in, in container networks and then using purpose uh, made container intrusion detection analysis tooling to kind of see what the efficacy levels were, right? Um, I think the next step for my research really is to get beyond that kind of comparative approach and really start digging deep into the kernel. Um, one of the things that, that I talk about in my research is the benefit of using kind of um, user, user space uh, security instrumentation to get visibility onto your hosts and get visibility into your network, and then compare that to using um, kernel space and kernel modules to tap um, uh, kernel API calls, sys calls, um, the, the instantiation of container groups and the use of namespaces. That I think is probably th the next step, is getting very, very deep into inter-container communications, uh, container to host communications, container host to container host communications and really start pushing the envelope of the types of attacks that I use to, to, to stimulate the environment, to provide the stimulus, and then being able to understand what uh, detection and response really looks like in those environments. Th that's the next step. That sounds great. So thanks for talking to me here and thanks to everybody for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.